Yes, good point. <laughs> Uh, welcome everybody to Fridays at Five. We are happy to have Chelsea Olson in the room today to share her insights on giving pronunciation feedback to a range of age groups and online. Please welcome Chelsea with uh, virtual applause. Well done. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to share. Okay, first you have to allow me to share my screen. <laughs> oh yes, that's right. We have this funny security thing happening here. All right, you are empowered. Okay. Let's see. Go here. Desktop. Share. Okay. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I'm excited to share a little bit about my teaching and what that looks like. Oh, present. There we go. Present. Okay. Can everyone see okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, like Karen said, my name is Chelsea and I've been teaching for five or six years and I stumbled into the world of online teaching a few years ago and now have become um, <laughs> the go-to for a lot of people to ask me questions for online things because um, I've been teaching with VIP Kid for two years. I'm developing courses and so it seems like I'm now ingratiated into the world of online. Um, so we're going to talk today about online teaching and error correction. And error correction is an interesting topic because um, it feels like a lot of teachers feel a little worried to give error correction because they don't want to embarrass their students. They don't want to interrupt the flow of the conversation. So maybe they tend not to give error correction and give that corrective feedback. Um, but research shows that error correction is a very important part of second language acquisition and learners want that feedback so that they can improve their spoken English. So that is the topic for today. And oh, let me go back. So um, just a brief overview of what we'll talk about. So I'm going to give a brief introduction of um, my VIP kid teaching context, what that looks like online and um, a little bit into the behind the scenes part of um, the curriculum and how students go about booking classes and then um, jump into error correction, talk about why it's important, um, when to correct, and then some key factors for making decisions to correct. Um, and then into the different types, direct versus indirect types of error correction. And then finally, we'll um, jump into a few different examples from my actual classroom so we can see the error correction in use using the color vowel approach and how I um, correct different different levels and ages of um, pronunciation errors using the color vowel approach. Okay, so VIP kid. Um, so maybe we can type in the chat box. Um, has everyone heard of VIP kid? I'm trying to see if I can. We can try a yes, no poll. If everyone yeah. looks in the chat, there's a yes and there's a no um, up toward the top of the chat. So if you have heard of VIP Kid or not, click yes or no. I'm seeing some mixed. <laughs> yeah, this will help Chelsea know how much to talk about this. I don't see anything in the chat box. Ah. A... It's under participants. If you go to the participants down at the bottom, that's where all those things are. Great. So go to participants and you can check yes or no. Just gives us a little bit of a pulse. Still not seeing that for what it's worth. <laughs> it's just you, Liz. No, <laughs> no, we're very happy to have you tell us. Uh, we're all kind of searching for it. I can see it in other ways, but it, um, and I actually you, you gotta open up the participants list. Yes. Yes. And at the bottom, it says yes, no, go slower, go faster. Oh, I see. Yes or no. Okay. And Liz, actually, I remember when we were in, um, when you were helping with uh, Color Vowel Basics, you were interested in um, one of my words that I put in my organizer was bookings. So I kind of designed some of this with you in mind, thinking I should share more about what VIP care actually looks like. So great. Yeah. Okay. So I'll continue on. Great. So um, you have some who don't and some who do. Yeah. Yeah. So VIP Kid, um, I'm trying to think when it became established. I think it's been around for five years now. Mm -hmm. um, and it started as a startup with um, not very many teachers and it's grown to, I believe, 
Oh, I want to say there's at least a hundred thousand teachers, but I think there's more and um, North American wow. teachers, but they live abroad and live in all different places. So um, I have a teacher friend who teaches a VIP kid that's teaching also in Dubai. So it's a really widespread company based out of China. Um, and it offers one-on-one -on -one video lessons um, with a, a native, um, native, or a native <laughs> North American teacher um, with a Chinese learner. And the, the students range in ages from very little, four or five, all the way up to I, my oldest student is 14. And that's pretty high. Usually they cap at 12, but some are a little bit older. And um, the levels also range from very beginner, pre, Level one is what they call it. They're just learning um, the sounds, they're learning to read, and then all the way up to, they just established a level eight where these students are very um, academic focused and preparing for the TOEFL and um, that sort of thing. So each lesson um, that students have with their teacher is 25 minutes. So it's very short, compact lesson. Um, and these lessons are designed um, with a team from VIP Kid with Common Core curriculum from the United States um, in mind. So, oh, let me go back. Did I skip one? Okay, so the booking part. So teachers, um, it's a really flexible teaching schedule. You open your schedule for how many um, classes you're available to teach. This is what my schedule looked like this week. Um, students, some students of mine are going back to school and so um, have a little bit of blue in my schedule. So that's a positive that they're going back to school and getting adjusted. Um, and the green means that those are slots that have booked. Um, so teachers open their time slots and then parents, they book them. And then you might have regular students, um, but what's unique is that um, you might not have, you might not be that, that students only teacher. So um, you might see them for um, one lesson and then they'll have a couple other teachers and then you skip ahead to um, maybe the fourth lesson in the sequence of 12 lessons. And so it's really interesting. You have to stay on top of their curriculum and prepare ahead of time um, and that sort of thing. So like I said, you can have regular students. Um, you might have students that you see two or three times a week and others you might see less regularly. Um, but using the teacher app, you can um, get all of the curriculum information. So this is what my app looked like for one of my days this week. Um, so here is my schedule, my three upcoming classes. And then if I click into them, it looks like this part on the right. So I can see um, the learner information, their name, their age, their level, and then also their teacher feedback and comments from their last lessons. Um, and then each lesson or each, um, all of the materials for each lesson contain the curriculum information objectives. And then when you go to view materials, you have the entire slide to prepare. So, okay. Moving on into so, my Chelsea, I have a, can you take a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I have a question about when you showed your schedule, the green was like, let's go lessons and the blue were lessons that were canceled or something. So blue was open and available. Um, so student, a student hadn't booked for that period and green was that they booked. Oh, okay. And, and how, how soon to that time slot can somebody, like can somebody book that time slot the same day? Yeah, good question. So they have a couple okay. of options. Um, you open, you typically open your schedule um, for, for the following week on Sunday, but you can leave the option um, that a student can book you within the 24 hour period and you just, oh, I can't click it here, but um, you would click on the blue and choose that option and then up to, I think an hour that student can book you. And you actually, there's a pay incentives, like you get a, a dollar extra if you have that option. Okay. I, just, you know, to adapt for your um, flexibility and <laughs> you might have um, a last minute class they have to prepare for. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay. My classroom, um, my teaching is a little bit unique because typically teachers either with VIP kid either specialize in doing very young um, levels. So levels like one, 
even pre pre VIP kid, which is very little, maybe four years old, um, levels one and two, and then upper levels three, four, and five. But um, I really do a wide range. So I have levels two through seven. And so that's beginner, intermediate, various levels of intermediate, and then advanced students that are um, in early, in either late middle school or early high school that are academic focused. Um, so actually, if we look back, I taught a level seven this week. And that's why on Monday, there is an hour block there because those level seven classes are an hour. So um, that's the only difference between the other levels are all 25 minutes, level sevens are an hour. I just started teaching those mm, a couple months ago. So it makes me feel more like I'm in the university classroom again, even though they're young, but they're very focused. So, okay. So um, today we'll look at my classroom and um, footage of interactions with my students that highlight error correction and specifically um, pronunciation errors and how I've corrected them using the color vowel approach. So I'm gonna stop talking for a minute and ask another question about um, what is your approach to error correction? So um, do you correct all the errors? Some parents want, um, like with VIP kid, want all of the errors corrected and that's not really feasible. Um, minimum error correction, do you correct based on context, meaning versus accuracy activities, or do you never correct errors? Oops, let me go back. I'm trying to find my chat. Okay. So I see context, good. Does it, um, and anyone can jump in, um, does your approach to error correction change based on level and age? Would you be more um, apt to correcting errors for younger students versus older? Um, would your approach to error correction change based on those things? I see Liz say it changes based on level. Mm. I try not to stop while my students are talking. Yeah, that's a very, we'll talk about that as well. Not age, but level. So Lynn, do you want to talk about changes based on student personality? Um, yeah, if I have a learner who's you know, really shy and reserved. Um, I really concentrate on just getting them comfortable and getting used to using English because that's, you know, if I correct them too often, then they tend to want to shut down sometimes. And, and I'm trying to keep them from shutting down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. So our, our goal is to find that balance, right? So to build the rapport and, and have that um, supportive environment and find ways where we can correct when the context, um, when it's a um, error that affects like comprehensibility or things like of that nature, but we wanna do it in a way where we're not having the student shut down, like you said. Okay, so let's continue on. Oops. Okay, so why is error correction important? So. Providing error correction is an important part of um, second language acquisition and um, providing those errors helps our students um, with developing their uh, second language skills. So when learners attention is drawn to their error, then they can file that in their interlanguage and make that correction internally um, and then hopefully can produce it in output later on. Oops. Okay, did I skip one? Okay, so um, correcting vowel sounds and stress is particularly important because um, as Karen mentioned in the Wednesdays at one, um, when you differentiated between not wanting to correct the TH sounds but wanting to correct vowel sounds, vowel sounds affect the comprehensibility and whether we can understand what a learner is saying. So um, providing 
the correct target form for vowel sounds and stress is important. So it's something we want um, to focus on, obviously. Um, but when should we correct? So like many of you said, you, um, you correct based on the situation. So if an activity is focused on accuracy, then obviously we'd want to correct the, the form that we are focusing on. But if um, the activity is meaning um, or fluency based, we might not want to interrupt that flow, and that's when we might use strategies like recasts. Um, but the problem is, do our learners notice that error when we do those sorts of things? Um, and then if um, the error impedes comprehensibility, then of course we want also to provide some sort of corrective feedback. Um, but another thing that affects our um, decision making with whether we should correct or not is cultural factors. So with working with my Chinese students um, and other Asian cultures, the concept of saving face. So if um, we overcorrect, um, a, a student might shut down and be unwilling to, um, to speak and take those language risks. So we wanna find that balance with providing the corrective feedback in a supportive way um, that allows them to keep speaking. Okay. So two key factors um, that affect how we give error correction um, and how I give error correction is creating um, a welcoming and supportive environment. So we want to lower the learner's effective filter and provide error, corrective, or <laughs> provide error correction in a way that um, is supportive and builds their confidence in speaking rather than um, forcing them to shut down and be um, unwilling to speak. Um, the other factor with um, deciding what sort of error correction to give is noticing. So wanting to use a strategy where a learner will um, notice that a correction has been made and they can notice the gap between their, um, their spoken output and the correct form. Oh, Liz, were you gonna say something? I thought I saw your... Um yeah, no, just somebody uh, said, uh, can you uh, give the definition of recast? Because not everybody knows what recast yes. is. Yes, okay, and I think that, um, nope, not yet. Okay, so recast um, is on the continuum. I'm just going to skip ahead for one second. So um, recast is here on the indirect strategies of corrective feedback. So um, if, if um, an interaction is um, communicative and we're focusing on student output, we might um, give a recast. So for example, if my student said, I just had a student that said, um, let's see, or actually I'm gonna give a different one. So say my student said, um, I, I went with my, my mother to, um, to the market today. He, he, bought me, um, he bought me a snack. So instead of pointing out that, um, that error, I might recast and just correct it in my, um, in my interaction with them. So I would say, oh, she bought you a snack. What kind of snack did you buy? So it's correcting the error while you continue to speak um, instead of pointing out the error directly. Thank you. Yes. Okay, let me go to here. So color vowel technique. Um, so the ways that I incorporate the color vowel in my corrective feedback is by using um, my anchor phrases and images. So before I was using um, an adapted method, but I just got my cards not too long ago. So I've been using my anchor phrase um, cards and using the images as well as the phrases. Um, so I use these to point out um, the, the error that a student might make between different sounds, like for example, distinctions between silver and green. Um, and if a learner is lower level, I might use the, the image instead of the, oh, instead of the phrase, just, I did it. <laughs> instead of the phrase, just to give them that visualization um, and something to uh, make it more meaningful for them. So using anchor phrases and images, and then also using the open hand gesture. Um, in one of the examples, I have a very enthusiastic student that uses the open hand gesture, and some are a little bit more reluctant, but continuing to use that with them. Um, and then flooding, so using words with 
the same sounds re repetitively to um, have them overcome that issue that they're having with hearing the sounds. Just want to check the chat to make sure it's going up. Okay, so moving on into the different types of strategies. So there's different types of corrective feedback strategies that we might use depending on the situation. So um, this is um, a visualization of moving from direct strategies to indirect. So um, the most direct strategy would be explicit correction. So saying, no, you made a mistake. Here is the correct form. Um, and teachers um, in research tend maybe to shy away from using this um, strategy in some cases because they worry that a learner might shut down if given explicit correction and that's when they might um, opt for more indirect strategies like recasts. But explicit correction um, allows for learners to notice the mistake. So doing so in a way that is supportive um, can be a very effective strategy. Um, so also offering a choice, giving, um, for example, um, I'll show a video of a student that um, was working with connecting um, the blue sound with spelling. And um, I gave him the choice between, is it O-E? Is it O-O? So offering choices um, and hoping that they will notice their error and self-correct. And then um, metalinguistic feedback. So talking about the language and um, pointing out their errors um, and this, this strategy is more with learners that um, are higher level can reflect on their language abilities and can talk about this. So I have an example um, here that we'll look at with my level seven student that um, can reflect on her language skills. Okay, so that was a lot. Any questions on anything so far? I'll keep going. Um, and then in the middle is the um, elicitation. So you're trying to elicit um, the, the self-correction or elicit the, um, the student to, um, to self-correct on their own by pointing out their error. So I tend to underline the error and see if they will correct it by prompting. Um, my voice rises and in a question form to see if they will self-correct on their own. So you're trying to um, Without being, without directly saying no, your your um, your spoken language was wrong. Um, you're trying to elicit that self-correction. And then indirect strategies. So we talked about recasts when you are um, correcting their mistake without directly pointing it out. So you um, continue maybe the conversation and with the correct form, but um, you don't explicitly point out that correction. And lastly, clarification request. You ask the, the learner, what was that? Can you repeat what your answer was? Um, hoping that they will self-correct on their own. So this is a Hold on. round. Okay, so moving on to the videos. Anything okay. anyone wants to say before I jump into the videos? Can't wait, it's exciting. <laughs> Okay, so I just wanted to um, preface this with a little background of this student. So um, this is one of my favorite students, Kitty is her English name. And she is a level three student and she's 10 years old. And there's two parts in this video. Um, the first part is the, um, the instruction and the flooding of this diphthong. And we're using the open hand and flooding um, with here with brown cow. And then before this, we were doing um, turquoise toy. We won't see the turquoise toy part. But I say that because in the second part, we will reference it. So we'll just look here. Notice um, her use of flooding, um, my use of the open hand and trying to get her to also use that. I, I'd like to add that this yeah. is, for, in my experience, this is one of the most difficult sounds for <laughs> Chinese speakers to grasp. Yeah, yes, thanks, Liz. That's a good point. It is the diphthongs are pretty difficult for them. <laughs> okay, so let me start it. So this is a brown cow. Brown. Okay, so the same sounds for all of these. Mouth. Couch. Howl. 
Brown cow and cow. Yes. Okay. Let's let's say quickly. Say brown cow. Brown cow. Brown cow. Brown cow. Brown cow. Brown cow. Oh. So same sound. Remember. Ow. Cow. Very good. Howl, cow. Cow. Okay, let me pause I'm it there. So yeah, so uh, she had some difficulties with the couch, and then in an earlier side, the um, the final consonant L, so soil, was also challenging there. Um, so in the second part, um, this is the guided practice where she's practicing the turquoise toy sounds in a passage. And it's, it's hard to hear, but at the very end, um, she self-corrects. And I attribute it, I don't know for sure, but um, in my interpretation, she, because of the repetitive nature of the, um, the turquoise toy sounds, she hears that difference with that final boy is where the error is. And she self-corrects. Okay. So, you, 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 toy, but the toy gives you toy. Could you give me the toy at very good. Yes, good. Ask the boy. Great job. So it's hard to hear, but um, she self-corrected there, so I was very proud of her. <laughs> okay, so that's an example of the explicit correction. Oops, hold on. Um, the next one is um, also a direct strategy, and it's offering a choice. So this um, was a spelling activity, but it morphed into a little bit of um, recognizing that the letters don't always connect with sound. So he assumed that OO makes the OO sound and only OO. And um, so we see here him recognizing that OE can also make the OO sound. Shoes. Shoes? So wait, shoes, S H. What two letters? Oh, 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 oh. Is it O E? No, O O. Or is it E O? No. Oh, you, you think O O? Yeah. So actually, it's like this O E. So all E also makes the OO sound, shoes. So OO, like moon. Moon. And blue. Shoes. And also all E, they all say OO. Moon. Shoes. The blue, good. Say again. Mm. Good. Shoes. Blue moon shoes. Shoes. Can you say all three? Blue moon shoes. Blue moon shoes. Yes, very good. I tried to get a little bit of that rhythm going by having him use the anchor phrase together. Um, but you could, it's hard to see with having to blur, but it, he was starting to believe me towards the end that, oh, oh, E does make the ooh sound. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So any, I thought I saw some movement in the chat. Uh, there's just a little question about, uh, does VIP kid use color mm -hmm. vowel? And I, I said, well, we <laughs> sort of, I mean, in the sense that we have, we have color vowel trained teachers like you and, uh, uh, Maybe maybe a handful of others mm -hmm. who are color vowel trained who teach for VIP kid. Is that accurate, Chelsea? Yeah, I would agree with that. And that's what makes it a little challenging because I'm trying, you know, I try to find ways to integrate the color vowel approach in my limited 25 minute sessions. Mm -hmm. um, I would really like to be able to one day be able um, to to reference the chart and have more time to spend with the chart and go through it. But right now, I'm uh, having to use the anchor phrases and, and images to incorporate and as my way 
<laughs> into the color vowel approach. Yeah. Well, but and those... that's the way it is with all of us. I mean, we teachers are the first adopters and you carry the message to your schools. So mm -hmm. that's the right way to go. Yes. <laughs> but Chelsea, the, this activity, is that, did you create this activity or did, is that something that's given to you? So with uh, VAP kit, all of the, so this is part of um, like a 20 some slide presentation that they've created and they're pretty strict about wanting you to stick to their curriculum. And I do extensions outside of it. So they encourage us to um, reward them with stars. And when we do that, to incorporate extensions and things. Um, and, and we use, we supplement with, with different um, things for the curriculum, but this was designed by them and they're pretty adamant about sticking to their curriculum. Yeah, but that's a great testament to the fact that you can incorporate, you can work the color vowel system into whatever curriculum you have. You don't have to teach the color vowel system. You just can use it with whatever you're already doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm still working on my older students. Um, they're very focused, and so they, they don't like when I deviate too much from the curriculum, but I'm trying to, um, I actually told one of my oldest students about Blue, Blue Canoe, and she said, oh, I have to spend so much time on TOEFL vocabulary words every day. I don't know if I can do that, um, but just trying to explain to them why it's uh, worth, worthwhile and why it's important. And this is that student. Okay, so this is the metalinguistic feedback. And this is um, my student named Sine, S-I-N-E. Um, and she's 12 years old and a level seven. And we've had about 20 classes together. Um, she was very reserved at first and a hard, hard one to crack. And um, as you can see with our rapport in this activity towards the end, um, we've, we've formed a connection and I can tell she feels more comfortable now with me. In the beginning, I, I would not do a lot of correction, but now I feel comfortable that she um, can receive the correction in, in a way that she feels supported and um, she continues on. So here um, we're looking at an error with a specific word. And then um, what's interesting is she has the uh, critical thinking skills and uh, reflective language skills to notice that um, the, the word is, there might be a little bit of L1 interference with um, pronunciation of this word, so. Chelsea is an elderly person who lives in a retirement home. She has been in a bad mood lately and not, nobody has been able to comfort her. She says she wants to go on one last adventure before her condition worsens. Her granddaughter. So yes, wait, before we move on to that part, um, this word, how do we say this word? Mark. Ah, so this word actually has these sounds, it has the blue moon sound. But my English teacher asked who the child is not. For this word with M-O-O-D? Yes, so we call in school called English, English. Chinese oh. English. <laughs> so maybe you said it with a bit of Chinese sound. Maybe that's why it's, yes. <laughs> so she, she referenced Chinglish so that she's combining some uh, Chinese sounds with her pronunciation of this word, which I thought was interesting. Okay. Or two. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, so this student is quite young. This is Chen and he is seven years old and a level two. So it's the lowest level that I teach. Um, and here, he's one of my few students that he was very enthusiastic about using the open hand and um, using the, the anchor image and um, using these techniques to, um, to correct that pronunciation. So. For two. Say A's. Yes. Good. Like this word. Gray. Gray. Gray day. Gray day. Very good. Say gray days. Gray days. Very 
Okay. The mom. The mom has been worried for two days. <laughs> Great job! Yay! Wonderful. He was so sweet. He <laughs> so you see that he he used the the open hand gesture, and I think that helped him a little bit with. Uh, it, it still needs some work, but he was doing really good with that. No, and oh, he's, the, exactly. the length was created. wonderful. Oh, it was fantastic. We're very excited. Days. I get so excited. Yes. Yeah, Karen, what did you say? He's creating the time. You know, he's creating yeah. the time he needs to then the next in another lesson. That's when you can do a nice, even without the chart, just A and yeah. move up the jaw and he's set. Isn't so. it lovely when you have students like this that they're just so willing and. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he was amazing. Okay. Oh, so this is the last one and this is just an example of recast and as recast is an indirect strategy um there's there's not a, a way to integrate really the approach in this one because i'm just recasting her error in a in the correct form um but i just wanted to give an example here <laughs> and who is he oh yeah is he a singer or an actor? Uh, he's a singer. Singer. And what would you want to write him? What would you say? I will say, my friend is very, very lucky. <laughs> so my friend <laughs> really likes you. <laughs> Do you like him too? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so there, instead of, you know, explicitly saying, oh, actually, we would say really likes because it was a communicative activity. Um, I just recasted and corrected that error and just kept going. Um, <laughs> I like that she she explained. Oh, my my friend really likes this <laughs> yeah. singer, but yeah. Okay, so that is what I have for you, and I can um, open it to to questions. I I hope it was helpful. Yeah, it was great, Chelsea. Thank you so much. Yeah, really great examples, you know, and lovely how your your employer lets you use videos to share with us. Mm -hmm. yeah. I liked the way that you were able to use the visual feedback. So having having the chart or the, the card that you just held up and uh, without without doing the listen to me and then repeat, it works much better yeah. if they have something they can refer to. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's right. I mean, the image cards really come in handy, don't they? It's, I see you holding those up all the time. So <laughs> if anybody yeah. doesn't have them, they're available. I was going to say, after our talk, you said, oh, no, you need to get the, uh, the upgraded because I was using the, what you the said, the, the, for a matching activity. That's right. This is what I use for a while. And it has the red dress instead of red pepper. <laughs> I so want how to many of, yeah, oh, let's sorry. hear from some folks in, in our community here. I'd yes. love to hear what you're doing uh, with, with feedback and with ColorVal mm -hmm. and any other tips we can add in and connect to what Chelsea's been talking about today. I wanted you. to share something that I do with my classes. Um, of course, you're one-on-one, -on -one, so this is not so much uh, an issue for you, you but uh, in my classes, there's a lot of issue with saving face and people don't want to be put on the spot being the only one to repeat the word over and over again or uh, be told they're wrong. And so um, what I do is I have everybody uh, say the phrase that the student was having trouble producing. And uh, sometimes they're, they're useful phrases and sometimes they're kind of personal phrases. I, I remember once we had the class repeating, my husband is a bad man, he hits me because one of the students had to be able to say this to her social worker. And uh, so she came in for help saying that. And so we all, we were all very enthusiastic about, uh, about working on that sentence, but that way we could all do it in chorus and use the, the hands to, um, to make sure that the stress was in the right place and that she could, she could say it. And there, there was a lot of, um, and a, a communal support for being able to produce the the utterance she needed to be able to say. Right.
Um, I, I have advanced learners. Um, usually I have beginners, but I've taken on an advanced class. So it's very interesting. They were kind of reluctant at first. They're older, they're adults. Um, but I find if I'm in the classroom, when we're doing something, a lot of times, if I don't want to break my, the momentum going on, I'll just real quietly write the word on the board and then eventually we'll come back to it and it's addressed as an entire class. Um, and I find that's very helpful. They all appreciate that the entire class does. And then usually from that, we end up jumping off for other things because then that'll spawn another question about another word or, or whatnot. So that's really helpful. And when I was teaching online um, these past weeks, um, it took me a couple of weeks, but I finally got a system down to how I could address that online as well and have them have it be like on the board because I didn't have access to a board and things like that. So, um, and I was just keeping it in a work document and um, I would share my screen with them and it was just a little table and it would have the word and then the, the color, I, but I would have them fill it in the color and then we discuss it and maybe put it in a sentence or however we decided to discuss it, the meaning of it or anything like that. So, but I do find that it's much more helpful to let all of them work on something. Lynn, you touch on something that was just on my mind, and then you were right there with it, which is, uh, I'd love to hear what tools we're using. You know, Chelsea's examples were within a framework or a interface, a platform that you use with your v VIP kids. Um, and so you're able, I can see that you're able to draw in there, right? And is that, you must have some a stylus, or are you doing that with your mouse, yeah. or... Yeah, um, there's just little features at the bottom. Um, you can do different things and they have like a pen feature and you can draw on the slides. Okay. And they and also have a chat box. You can chat in there too. Nice. But with a stylus, because the platform on Zoom was terrible unless you had a screen that you could write on. Oh, um, no, I use my mouse. Is that what you mean? Yeah, okay. So you use an actual, I guess, I'd love to think that I could take something like a trackpad and draw with it, but I've never been very successful with that. So. It took a long time to, to be able to, to write out words. And sometimes uh, students draw out pictures um, for different activities and they go, oh no, and I'll have them write on paper instead and show me. Yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> Karen, I'm thinking of how you would hold up a whiteboard and write right. Yeah, in fact, right now, I just, I have, I have several of these, um, thanks to Shirley, actually. <laughs> I still have them from previous workshops. We used to hand these out at workshops uh, to use them with participants, and then now that we don't do any face-to-face -face workshops, I have them. But one little thing I've been doing, um, and I think I learned this from somebody probably in the room, is um, I took one of my whiteboards and I, I wrote, this is something I use for teaching chants, right? So this is a standard little format. And so I did this in permanent pen. And that way I can fill in my words and then erase and do it again and again. Uh, so, I mean, just whatever it is you're using, whether you have a fancy platform like VIP Kid or um, something much more sort of uh, physical, it's important to have tools to convey and to communicate this feedback and guidance that we provide, right? So what other tools are you using out there? I'd love to know. Now, before you go on, have Lynn show her. Lynn, show yours again. I think Karen missed it. Oh, oh. I want to see that, Lynn. Oh, You're... we can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, unmute yourself. Lynn. Hold on, hold on. She's so excited. I'm going to unmute her. <laughs> I can't. Lynn, unmute yourself. <laughs> Okay, so sorry about this. This is left over from, from teaching. I did not teach this week, and I will say I have so needed the break. So, but then when you flip it over, then we have my, oops, ah. and I, I have a big one too back here on an easel, but this one was much, right. much quicker and handier to do this. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, yeah. The, and that's true. How do we show the chart, right? I, I need to do that. I have it behind me because I happen to have a nice wall. Jennifer, I see, has it, you know, sort of um, on a wall that's next to her. And Jennifer, you often move your laptop sort of more straight on, right? Um, how else do people get the chart shown? Oh, Liz, I can see. Well, that. it's not about the chart, but I, I was going to say that my, I teach 90% Japanese people and the adults that I teach unanimously say that the reason they like me as a teacher is that I correct their errors. 
Um, and I, maybe it varies across different language groups, but Japanese people, they, they know that they want to know what they're doing wrong, especially if they're beyond beginners, you know, if it's beginners, then I, yeah, I don't worry about it too much, but I just bring up like a, an empty, um, blank document of, of Google doc and share my screen. Well, I don't share it. I take notes as they're talking, even if it's in a class or one-on-one, -on -one, I take notes as they're talking. And then during a, a break, you know, somebody was saying in the chat, you don't want to interrupt them while they're in the middle of the conversation. So kind of let the conversation, you know, kind of end itself and then go to the, to the Google Doc and say, okay, this is what was said. And that also has the effect of sort of, if it's a class, it's not saying, oh, so-and-so said this. It's like, this was said, how could we say it better? And, it, and it, it serves a little bit the safe face. But in my classes, I, I correct everybody. And so I always say, you know, if your English is perfect, go home. Like, there's no reason for you to be here. So we're, we correct everybody's English. And then I just kind of try to break the ice early on so that nobody has to feel like, oh, she, I was wrong. I made a mistake. It's like, yeah, we, we all do. That's, that's why we're here, you know. So that's kind of my approach in a nutshell. But thank you, Chelsea, it was really good. I loved seeing the examples, they were awesome. Yeah, I'd like to, everybody do, uh, let's thank Chelsea for her time. As we, thank you, Chelsea. As we wrap up, one thing that comes to mind when I think about feedback is where does that moment go afterward, right? We find the word that needs a little nudge, uh, we find the right time and the right way to give the nudge. And then what happens to that moment? And I just hope that everyone's thinking about their color vowel organizer at this moment, <laughs> because that's really where the word one way or another needs to go into either the paper organizer for somebody who's maybe age 10 and above, um, or into a word wall situation for younger or low literacy learners. But that's a great place to record that this was a word that came up, or this is a phrase that came up, right? Um, and can I add, Karen, that even if it's not a pronunciation issue, if it's a vocabulary issue, or somebody used this word, you know, or phrase or whatever, a lot of times I like to put it in the organizer just so it, it comes up again, even if it wasn't a pronunciation error, but like they have to see that word. And what does that word mean again? Oh, yeah. That's right. So it's to park it. Yeah, and then I miss, I miss my word wall. How can we do that online? I wonder. Well, uh, I'm just I'm just throwing that out. I'm yeah. just, you know, Laura no. McAdoo made a virtual one. She made a, uh. a huge. Um, I, we've, we've got a great example. I, uh, you can use Excel. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have one in um, for, in an Excel that we was created for um, Panama Bilingue, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really it it works great because it's on. Um, it's actually Google um, Sheets, and so a anybody within a class can access it. Yeah, in fact, I think we have, here we go, Color Vault Organizer Sandbox uh, that I think Rebecca shared with us a while back. Mm -hmm. She's not with us today, but um, let me grab, what are we looking at here? I think that's it. Let's see, yeah? yeah so good. you can see here as I make it bigger, mm -hmm. all along the bottom, um, this might have been Laura who did this. Anyway, we, we give yeah, this is this is from me. Oh, oh, interest. This is from Jennifer. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Jennifer did this. <laughs> Welcome, Jennifer. Um, so yeah, Jennifer, tell us about this. Well, I I, I inherited it from uh, another teacher in uh, the Panama Bilingue program, and then I just sort of enhanced it and raised it to the fifth edition and. Um, fixed it a little, but anyway, um, yeah. So each each color has its own um, page or sheet, and um, I used it with uh, students would uh, be working in groups and coming out with vocabulary words, and they'd have to decide on their own what the colors were, and um, uh, and you know um, decide what was the um, stressed vowel or vowel letter. Um, when there were um, confusions about uh, definitions, 
um, you know, we, so we didn't write them all the time, but when it came up and um, uh, I would review it at the end of the week and we, words that were maybe miscategorized or words that could be in two different places, I would call out and then we'd have sort of a, a powwow about those once a week. Great. So this is just a one, you know, if you're teaching online as we all are, um, we're happy to share this. We can find a way to put that out there, right, Jennifer? Yeah, um, we can put this up on the, in the public folder, um, which is also, I'd like to mention where we've put um, Chelsea's presentation. Okay, so where, uh, where, where can we post a link to that public folder for people after this session? Um, on our Facebook page. There we go. Okay, so it'll be there. Uh, we might put it in an upcoming newsletter. Hey, I want as we wrap up a couple of things I want people to know because I know we have some newcomers in the room. I've shown here a few um, links for finding our future events. When you sign up for an event like you did today, uh, you do become part of our mailing list. So you'll now know about our months, in, I mean, our, our events in advance at the beginning of each month. Uh, but here, right here in the Zoom chat, I've just posted three sets of links that are handy. Uh, the first is just a link to our workshops and webinars page with more events. Uh, the second is our public uh, Facebook page. Great place to just like it and then you'll see what happens there. We, we sometimes do Facebook Live there. We um, post announcements, so it's handy to be there. And third is our super fun What Color Do You Hear page which is both for teachers and learners. It's a hashtag enhanced color vowel experience of beautiful photos and other images that are tagged by what we see in them and the vowel sounds that are stressed in those words. So it's wonderful for vocabulary um, activation. Um, so what else do we wanna say? Two courses coming up, as I mentioned at the beginning here. Uh, we have a course coming up on teaching chants, and so I'll actually finish with a connection to our final piece here. We were just showing, I think that's what it was, we were just showing these kinds of words in the sandbox or the, the color vowel organizer digital version. The, the advantage of putting these somewhere is not only that you can go back to the words that you've given feedback on, but also that when they're organized in, in an organizer by color vowel, you can then finish up a session with something that's a little more upbeat than, oh, that was a big day today and kind of goodbye, but rather you can make a chant using a structure like this. And so I thought I'd just finish up with a small taste of what we'll be doing in our upcoming chants course, where you can take three words from a list like you see here. So let's pick, I don't know, I, I love squirrel because um, that was one of the first words I heard a student um, mispronounce in such a way that I didn't know what it was. <laughs> it was squiddle. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a fascinating word. So here's squirrel. Um, let's pick another one, um, maybe early. And we know that this is hard for the student and maybe world. They don't have to have a strong relationship to one another necessarily. Sometimes you find three words that have a beautiful relationship and then you've got something even better but for now this is a nice improvised chant and if you have your mute on as you do we're going to do something like this with a beat like this a b c a b c a b a b a b c that's the pattern okay so we're going to use a is squirrel b is early and c is world so we'll come something like this. We'll go pretty slow. So here we go. One, two, ready, go. Squirrel, early, world. Squirrel, early, world. Squirrel, early, squirrel, early, squirry, early, world. Squirrel. <laughs> There's your nice tongue twister for the day. We can come back over to the chart and make sure that the student knows what to do with that sound. Otherwise, we're really just kind of um, reinforcing old patterns. So we can come here and remember that whether you're curling or bunching your tongue, it will not touch the roof of your mouth, right? And then we can come back with a nice purple shirt. One more time and we're out of here. Purple shirt, ready? 
Squirrel early world. Squirrel early world. Squirrel early, squirrel early, squirrel early world. Perfect. All right, so that's a taste of the chance workshop. We'll be going, uh, learning three written chants and then learning how to create spontaneous chants. But most of all, and this gets back to Chelsea, we want to thank you so much. It gets back to when do we use chance as an intervention and why and what is the timing that's needed? Because we don't want to chant just to take up time and we don't want to chant to make our students cringe because their teacher is breaking out into song again. Um, this really is, it's a, it's a very um, sort of acute intervention for practice and then you move right back into the content part of the lesson. So that's a bit on what we're going to be doing with our chance course. I hope you'll join us there teachers. Uh, this is for our level one trained teachers. If you're not yet level one trained, join us for Color Val Basics. We'll be offering it coming up in August. We are taking a break from Color Val Basics this summer so that we can rest, relax, and plan for the fall, okay? Um, thank you everybody for coming, Chelsea for presenting. Um, and really, this has been an incredible uh, era of pandemic presentation in our group. We've had, we'll have Robin next week as kind of a final cap on all of our Friday at fives, we might continue. So if you have a topic and you feel like you're ready to share that, we want to hear from you for future Fridays at five. Um, you know, you can see that it's informal and yet it's prepared. And here's this wonderful community of people who want to hear what we all have to say, okay? So think about that, keep in touch and we'll see you soon. Bye everybody. Thank you.